So we'll talk about homes, but I'd uh, rather s start with cities. Uh, and uh, we heard a lot this morning about rapid urbanization and the hundreds of new cities that are being built. All too often, this is what we're ending up with. These are dreary, single-purpose, residential ghettos uh, that are almost totally dependent on the private automobile. Uh, <coughs> if you go to uh, Taipei, where I took this photograph, you see these generic commodity housing projects um, sort of bursting with this expression of personalization, you know, kind of ad hoc customization. They're, they're illegal and often they're death traps, but it's a powerful uh, sort of visual acknowledgement of that desire. Uh, another trend, how many people know who this guy in the middle is here? That's uh, our Mayor Bloomberg of New York. So he's saying, uh, in order for New York City to remain globally competitive, they have to make housing affordable for young people. So the idea is just build tiny little apartments. Uh, our Mayor Menino in New York, in uh, Boston says the same thing. The problem is young people don't really like these tiny little apartments with a pull-out sofa. This is the American dream of owning your house and owning your car and freedom and status and all of that. Uh, and I think as uh, John referred to, that's breaking down. Young people, the millennial generation, are rejecting private cars, private homes, brands, owning a lot of stuff. They're, they think of all these things as services rather than possessions. And I think that will powerfully impact cities in the future. So we're thinking of all of these things in life increasingly as a service. So the first notion is space on demand. So we have this, this idea that you standardize the chassis of a multifamily home and you have a process of personalization where the um, people um, bring in disentangled uh, furniture and cabinetry and technology enabled components that can be rapidly assembled. I'm an architect, but it doesn't scale to have an architect work on homes for 300 million rural Chinese who are moving to the city over the next 15 years. So we're looking at design algorithms where you match a personal profile to a so solution profile, you assemble a completely configured apartment, and then you give people the tools to go into that space and refine it using these kind of advanced computational tools. Uh, for the city, though, I'm particularly interested in now in transformable houses, tiny little homes that function as if they were many times uh, larger. Uh, this is our extra large apartment, <laughs> it's 800 square feet, where it converts from a, an exercise space to a workspace when your employees come in, to two guest suites when you have people over, to conventional bedroom arrangement, uh, dinner party for 14 people or, or so, and a party space where you can <laughs> hang out with your friends. So. So actually, the, the, the personalization process is defining what your activities are, and then the, the, the space is configured accordingly. This is our prototype of what we think of as a uh, robo-wall, which in our mind is a platform for bringing in personalization and customization and, and uh, technology into the home. I don't believe in smart homes. I think that's a totally bogus concept. I think builders only know how to build dumb things, so you want to make bring smart things into the home. Uh, sharing is really important uh, for working because uh, as work is becoming distributed and mobile, I don't think we'll have housing projects. We'll have these integrated projects that will have workplaces like this. This is the workplace of the future. It's a Starbucks. And uh, because people have internet access and food and they're in their private little bubble of space and other people are around them and they actually have more privacy than in the office. We're, we're moving towards... Uh, Shared resources in the office, uh, shared desk, shared shop, shared fab lab, shared electronics lab, shared recreational spaces, all these will be integrated. Technology and demand, we're also looking at having sensor networks in these spaces that can respond to human behavior in real time. This is a project with Siemens where we have tunable LED lights that respond to activities. We also have a project where at the facade you can have personal sunlight by having an articulating mirror that throws light deep into the space and you map your activity to light. 
food on demand we have a project now to develop personalized high tech aeroponics farming where you can actually personalize the water and the light that hits a plant according and have a have sensors and automation that can support that learning on demand we we take this sensor now me siento en el sofa so in this case you also as a person moves through the space since you have sensors on everything it can teach a foreign language to the individual much like a mother teaches baby uh, a, a new language so it's what we think of this as a natural learning tool and i'm going to just show one more thing quick mobility on demand so connected to this uh, service will al also be a whole set of uh, vehicles that um, are linked to mass transit that's our robo scooter our green wheel our uh, city car that actually folds with robotic wheels and you can get three up to five uh, cars in a conventional parking space so in the end what you want to have is this whole network of solutions from living to mobility to working to farming to energy all integrated sorry that i i i broke the rule and talked about something other than housing <laughs> well thank you so much Ken. So Dan Suchit this morning suggested that sort of speculating about future scenarios has become a dull exercise. And I'm kind of left, I'm not suggesting it's a dull exercise what we have just seen, but I'm kind of puzzled by the contrast between what we're seeing in the real world out there where we're struggling in this country in particular to even install smart meters, and, and then what you have just presented, which is just at a completely different scale. So. I'd, I'd be interested in your uh, assessment of how much um, this largely sort of re research-informed exercise can be linked back to an emerging reality where we're not talking about the next 10 years, but the next months or years. Well, I think, I think um, uh, John said it, you, you have to build a new model. You can't try to force change on the old model. And we, we at the Media Lab are looking to our corporate sponsors to work with us to commercialize this. We can't do anything in the world directly in an academic institute. That the city car is being commercialized now in Spain, the green wheel is being commercialized in Taiwan. Uh, we, we have a startup that we spun out to do these transformable infill products in homes. And I think the challenge, we have plenty of good ideas out there. The challenge is, uh, companies who find the right business model. And I and actually think there are a lot of good business models out there. It's just really a lack of, uh, of implementation at this point. A another attraction of what we've just seen is of course a strong design awareness, functional design, thinking about how it can also be integrated with a degree of aesthetic. But d Tom, as a designer, what, how does this feel if you see these scenarios? I d I'm hugely inspired by them because they talk about a value proposition. But what I find perhaps uh, more inspiring actually, it's not the sort of prefabrication and the personalization at the point of delivery, which has happened a long time. Like we talked about the 1850s, the great exhibition was a prefabricated building, which is fundamentally flexible. What I love about this, in a world of sort of increasing flux, these systems become modular and more adaptable. And so in a world where we're harder to predict, we're all harder to predict, our behavior's changing faster and faster, these buildings that Kent's designing, I think, have greater option value. I'm often amazed, I bought a house recently and the survey was all about how suitable it was for the exact use as it is. There was nothing in the survey about how it might be easily adapted and any startup will tell you that's where the value is, the flexibility in the system. Greg, I think uh, your presentation is directly linked, and I, I want to therefore already start uh, with yours, and then we have a bit more time to discuss and again bring, bring in the audience if there are questions and comments. So we're now focusing on the future office and innovation space, which was already touched upon, but a bit more in depth, please. <laughs> 